Hey, Breaking Points, check out this clip from my conversation with Michael Beckley about the relative strengths of the United States and China and how these strengths and weaknesses play into avoiding a conflict over the next decade. If you enjoy the episode and this clip, be sure to check our YouTube channel or you can find the realignment wherever you listen to your podcasts. Here's the clip. You are really just pushing back against both of those frames, both like the U.S. as a declining power and then China as the rising power. So can you start with the U.S. first? Like, why should we interpret this coming decade through the perspective of America not being on the decline? Well, I, I think if you if you look at sort of broad indicators of just which country has more wealth, um, which country has more military power projection capabilities, there's still a large gap between the United States and China. The U.S. has roughly three to four times China's overall wealth. And in terms of just being able to deploy military forces around the world and, and fight wars far from your shores, you know, it's it's um, still stacked very heavily in America's favor. I, I do think that there are local balances of power, though, where things have shifted in China's favor. So one is in the Taiwan Strait, where just because of the combination of geography and technology, China has home field advantage, essentially. It's only 100 miles from China. It's thousands of miles from the U.S. And the nature of precision guided munitions just makes sitting ducks out of a lot of the very powerful capabilities that the United States has, like its aircraft carriers and those big bases. So even though the overall balance of power remains stacked very much in America's favor, and even though the long term prospects of both countries for demographic reasons, for geographic and resource reasons for alliance and diplomatic reasons, I think is is even more stacked in America's favor and the long term trends are very favorable to the United States. There are these local balances of power where China has really translated a lot of its latent power into hard power assets on the ground, whether it's warships, sovereign loans around the developing world um, in, in a very aggressive way. And so that's why, you know, in this in the second book, I, I became much more focused on, OK, what happens when you have a power that is peaking and is not going to catch up to its main rival? Do they mellow out and dial back their ambitions? And in in this new book, you know, Hal and I go through all the historical cases where we've had a peaking power and they don't mellow out. They try to batter their way through the hard times. They try to score near term victories that alter the long term trends. And they try to basically grab whatever they can while they still can. And so that makes these local balances of power much more salient in this decade. So I think you can be both confident about the long term trends for the United States but deeply worried about some of these short-term red lights that are flashing, over, especially over something like Taiwan. You know, I'm curious. So the good way to think of the peaking power framework is that, you know, these peaking powers take disastrous gambles. Japan, Pearl Harbor, we went over that. Um, various references to Germany at various points during its history. Has there been a case where the gamble has paid off? Um, so the, it, the big ones where you have a country that, you know, goes on like a Hitler style rampage, those basically never end well. But I think there's a selection factor going on there, namely that the countries that had to go on Imperial Japan or Hitler style rampages were in the kind of, from their perspective, the most dire situations. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and so they had used force and the deck was already stacked against them. Uh, one of our cases is actually the United States in the late 19th century where, uh, you know, after the Civil War, there was actually a, an economic boom in the United States. The U.S. economy takes off as growing like gangbusters. But then in the 1880s and going into the 1890s, you have a series of depressions. Um, and, and there was this perception that the U.S. had already expanded across the continent and there were no more greenfield investment opportunities. We were running out of markets and resources. And that creates this push for what becomes this the, the grand era of American imperialism. Abroad, the U.S. reacts by basically pumping exports and investment into Latin America and East Asia and then building a huge military, especially a navy, to go protect those assets and eventually ends up annexing territory um, way beyond its its borders. And um, you could argue that in the U.S. case, it ultimately proved effective because the United States continued to grow. And, and that was one step towards becoming a major global power. I think the U.S. case, though, is not comparable to China today, because for one thing, the United States, you know, it was just growing demographically. It had tons of resources that China doesn't have. And it was emerging in the Western Hemisphere where there weren't other great powers, right? I mean, like mm -hmm. all the, at least their homelands, all of their homelands are based in Eurasia. Eurasia is just a death trap for rising powers. I mean, any power that's tried to rise there and beat back its rivals usually gets crushed in a vice, 
of all the other great powers ganging up on him, often with help from the United States. And that's what I think China is facing today. So they're not quite comparable. But if you're looking for a success case, I mean, the United States battered its way through those hard times in the 19th century and ends up emerging even more powerful and, and internationally engaged um, after uh, its its economic troubles in the 1880s and 1890s. What do you think about America decline narratives? I think that there's, you know, it's, it's sort of I'm a, as a podcaster, I'm kind of a professional zeitgeist watcher. And I think what's annoying about this conversation is you'll see people just give this, look at all these problems, polarization, political violence, gas, all the demographic, all these bits. And, you know, you could say, well, I mean, look at the mid 1970s, um, post Watergate, Vietnam defeat, 58,000 American, you know, troops dead. Um, it seems like on most of those, you know, a, a seemingly resurgent Soviet Union, it seems that at most of these decline, you know, thinking even like, you know, Japan's going to overtake America in the 80s. It seems like most of these times we've hit just decline narratives. They've been, oh, and I guess this gets to why I think your book is like really useful. Short term, it's easy to tell a story of American decline in the 70s and 80s. Long term, we were good to go. But now it seems the issue is it's the short term that actually matters the most with a possible conflict with China. So can you just like reflect on that? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, people that tout American decline in some ways are are a source of strength for the United States in the sense that you highlight weaknesses in the system and that can generate support for reforms. I mean, that's a critical weakness, I think, of the Chinese system. When you have a dictatorship, you can't let the dictator look unknowing or unwise or admit to major mistakes or turn things around. You ban negative news, which is what China has done in the economic sphere. And that makes reform, smart reforms difficult. And so in the US case, I think you can walk a fine line and say, look, it's actually good that we are constantly airing our dirty laundry, that we are paying, uh, that there's always an opposition party that is looking to essentially uh, highlight all of the mistakes and all the terrible things that are going on under the watch of the other party. But I do worry that you it is possible to cross that line from declinism to sort of nihilism and defeatism such that you uh, end up focusing more on your domestic political opponents and tearing each other apart rather than collaborating and coming together to actually fix a lot of these problems, which there always are going to be uh, in the United States. And I, I actually worry very much that even though the United States has tremendous advantages, demographic, geographic, um, in terms of its alliance structure, its basing structure around the world, that it could still crumble from within. I mean, we've seen that historically too, where great empires uh, fall prey to corruption and political division and even civil war. And in the United States today, I mean, levels of polarization are at their highest levels since uh, the the Civil War. And, um, you know, I think this upcoming election is actually a very scary moment for the nation. I don't think it will necessarily collapse, but it just could be a much uglier period in American politics. And that could slow the U.S. ability to respond to major international events. So for the last question, I realized we kind of buried the lead when it came to why is China actually a peaking power? Can you actually just outline for folks why long term, aside from this decade, the and once again we know this you know internally this is a concern within the chinese communist party why do china's prospects actually look weaker longer term than we would conventionally think but i think the first point to note is that you know double digit growth rates and a steady rise is not the norm for any country and especially not for china really the the past 40 years have been an anomaly most of chinese modern history is a, a tale of strife and, and poverty. I mean, really for a hundred years from 1839, from the first opium war to the end of the Chinese civil war in 1949, China is just ripped apart by imperialist powers and has two of the worst civil wars in recorded history. The Taiping rebellion alone kills 20 to 30 million people in the middle of the 19th century. And then even after the Chinese communist party unifies the nation and kicks out the Japanese, uh, China becomes the number one enemy of the United States almost immediately because of the Korean War, where they're fighting each other. And then 10 years later, China becomes the number one enemy of the Soviet Union because you have the Sino-Soviet split. And so it's not till the 1970s that China is not isolated and impoverished. And it, the, there were certain exceptional circumstances that made for China's subsequent exceptional rise. Um, and we think that all four of those circumstances are going away quickly. I mean, one is just 
you have uh, U.S. engagement and this period of hyper globalization where the U.S. sort of fast tracks China's um, entry into Western markets so it can get access to those markets, access to Western technology and capital. And this is the start of what we now refer to as hyper globalization. And lots of countries said, hey, we want to actually get in on China's economy. It's perfectly situated, huge uh, population for, for labor and consumption. And so China is able to ride that wave of hyper globalization to become the workshop of the world. A second sort of fleeting factor is the uh, demographic dividend. So China in the 1980s, 1990s, 2000s had anywhere between 10 to 15 workers for every retiree in its population. And that's because China had a big baby boom in the 1950s and 60s, then followed that up with a one child policy. Um, and so no population was more primed for productivity, I think, in human history than China was over the last 40 years. You had resource abundance. China was almost self-sufficient in most resources, which made growth very cheap because you had easy access to inputs. And then you had a Chinese government that was that was prioritizing economic growth and was willing to kind of get out of the way and let the Chinese people do their thing and have sort of quasi private enterprises to engage with foreigners and, um, you know, set up uh, export platforms. But, you know, lately we've seen all four of these factors really reverse. Obviously, we're moving from a period of hyper globalization to what some people are calling a new Cold War. I mean, the United States is waging a trade and tech war on China. Various other economies are following suit. China now faces thousands of new trade and investment barriers today that it didn't face as recently as 10 years ago. Um, China's running out of resources. You know, half of its water and arable land, almost all of its uh, deposits of energy are, are gone. And now it's the number one importer of food and energy and is suffering water scarcity. That's made growth three times more expensive. Every unit of GDP growth is three times more expensive to produce today than it was in the 2000s, just because inputs are so much more expensive and, and scarce. Uh, you have the end of that demographic dividend. Just between now and the, the 20, early 2030s, China is going to lose 70 million working age adults uh, and gain 120 million senior citizens. So that's like taking an entire France out of your workforce and adding an entire Japan of elderly retirees into your population. Um, and then lastly, you know, uh, the Chinese government seems to be sliding back towards neo-totalitarianism. And that wouldn't be so bad if Xi Jinping was a savvy economic reformer, but he just shows time and again, he is willing to sacrifice economic growth and efficiency in order to enhance his political control. The zero COVID lockdowns are just the latest manifestation of that. But you know, you can look at the regulatory crackdown on tech companies, um, uh, the fact that subsidies are channeled to state-owned enterprises that are very inefficient, the outline of negative economic news, which obviously makes reform hard. So we just look at all of these headwinds. We show that they're actually going to get worse in the years ahead. And that's why we characterize China more as a peaking power rather than one that's going to continue to rise. It's really returning to the historical norm of encountering geopolitical hostility in a much more difficult growth environment.